Hi, so today I'm going to install Perl from source code on Windows, particularly Windows uh, modified version of Windows 8.1, but this should work with uh, Windows 7 and Windows 10 as well. As you can see here, I've gone to Perl.org and you can click on download. The latest version is 5.32.0 as of the time of this recording. And then you'll see they uh, recommend Strawberry Pearl or Active State Pearl. And those are pre-compiled versions of Pearl, <clears throat> excuse me, for Windows. And I don't know, I'm not real happy with either one. I haven't used either one in a really long time and I remembered I had a bad taste in my mouth from my whole experience with it. I just tried to reinstall Active Pearl and it's junk. It doesn't even set the path like I just feel like wow you it even says there's a checkbox like do you want us to add Perl to the path and it just doesn't do it so I felt like you know that's that pretty much sums up you know if they don't can't even handle that first off right out the gate and then strawberry Perl which must have been the Perl that I went with in the past I think I tried them both but the the thing I don't like about this one is that it includes everything so it's sort of just it's a lot of extra stuff there that I don't know let's see how big this file would even be okay so I'm just gonna tell it to start downloading it and 101 megabytes the active Perl install was a little bigger than that after the entire install so I don't know maybe this one's not so bad but anyway I figured you know what I'm doing the reason I'm installing Perl is to install open SSL from source for Windows and uh, it, it needs Perl it needs Perl and make and an ANSI C compiler under Windows can probably work with like the min GW set too I imagine so what I did was I downloaded uh, the, oh shoot, I guess I should have gone, uh, showing you where I got that from. So what I did is I, you scroll all the way down here, Windows Source, and download the latest source. And I, well, that looks like that just gives you a tar GZ file anyway, so you could probably click download source on any of them, I'd imagine. They're probably all tar.gz files, but who knows, maybe the last one has Windows line, ending, line endings, but that shouldn't be a big deal either way. So then what I did was I have like a source folder where you just saw where I have like tons of just random source files, and... Then I go and you can just create that under your user folder, even under your downloads folder. It doesn't even matter. And then I go in here and I created a Perl folder. Um, I'd actually created this a while back just for storing Perl source code that I was dinking around with. But normally what I'll what I've switched to doing lately um, is just create like the folder because you can just extract these files and they'll automatically extract to a folder 99% of the time. But you know, occasionally they don't, and plus, the uh, just to be able to have like a subdirectory underneath it that's not like this general root directory. You know, that way I can come in here, and if I want to create like a Perl build directory or something like that, you know, I can do that without being in my general source folder type of thing. So anyway, I'll go into this specific version, and this is all the source code. This kind of goes for most like GNU style software. And whether you're under Linux or Mac OS or whatever, of course, there's going to be a lot of Windows-specific stuff here that varies from the Linux-specific stuff. But um, you come in here, you can see you can even install it for DOS with the 32-bit DOS with the DJ uh, C++ compiler. Sorry, I just ate, so I'm, like, trying not to burp. All right. So then what you do, like typical GNU-style software installs, is there'll be just a plain readme file like that. 
and I've already got my stuff set up to you can do the right click like open with usually in here somewhere I'm not even seeing it but I think maybe if you double click it and it doesn't have a thing set up then you should be able to you want to open it in like notepad or maybe something better than notepad because it probably doesn't have Windows style line endings and I don't know if Windows 10 finally started handling those properly but just basically open that in a text editor that's like slightly better than notepad but not word and you can also go in and add like a blank extension dot file to your uh, file handling settings in Windows. That's what I did to handle these automatically. I'm using Aquilpad. It's like a notepad replacement thing. So anyway, you'll come in here and you'll read this. And this will give you the general details. It's basically you open the readme file and then you open the install file. That's the general process for like installing from source and stuff. <clears throat> thought it was interesting down here under licensing that uh, it's... Uh, released under the GNU GPL version 1 or any later version but a lot of stuff's usually version 2 or any later version and I find it kind of funny too or not funny that they do the or at your option any later version because there's like significant different differences especially in 3 like I would rather just release stuff under version 2 no option to release under version 3 so it's kind of weird like who knows what version 4 will bring that it could be a completely different license it could be totally bogus and by saying or at your option any other version allows people that mysterious whatever who knows where the GNU software foundation will be in 20 years but anyway uh, this is kind of typical for most readme files you come down here and gets into the basic installation which is configure they have make tests but a lot of times it'll be configure make and then as an administrator or root user you do make install this one uses it looks like Perl it's got a capital C configure so it looks like it's gonna use Perl itself am I in the Perl Ruby yeah so I may need to already have Perl if you're using relatively hmm. we'll see or maybe it has like I might be screwed. I might have to use one of those binary Perl installs or something. But anyway, I'll just go roll with this and see where it goes. So that's the general readme file, um, especially if you're under Windows. You'll want to look for like a Windows specific one. Here's Win32. And uh, I'm going to double click that one. You'll just want to open it in a plain text editor that can probably handle Unix style line endings. And so it says, Perl Win32, these are the instructions for building on Windows 2000 or later, which is cool. Description before you start, you should glance through the readme file found at the top level directory, which we already did, to which the Perl distribution was extracted. Read and understand the terms. Also, make sure you read bugs and caveats and everything else. The install file, that's what I was talking about. And the Perl top level has much more information, only relevant to people building Perl on Unix-like systems. So that's good to know. In particular, you can safely ignore any information that talks about capital C configure. <laughs> good thing, because we don't have that. Or I don't think we have an existing Perl install to use. You may also want to look at one of the other options, at a, one other option for building a Perl that will work on Windows, the README SIGWIN file which SIGWIN's a lot like MSYS and MinGW32, but a little bit more robust, a little more uh, legit Unix environment, which will give a different set of rules to build a Perl for Windows. This method will probably enable you to build a more Unix-compatible Perl, but you will also need to download and use various other build time and runtime support software described in that file. I've actually been, back in the day, I used to avoid SIGWIN. It just seemed like so big, in the late 90s, early 2000s and stuff, I just always go with the minimal, the min GNU, or min GW, which stands for minimal GNU for Windows environment, and maybe MSYS. Uh, SIGWIN, of course, is the full deal with all that stuff, but in more recent, I haven't used it in a couple years or more, but in the more recent years, I've installed it, and I was just so much more happier with the performance and just everything about it and I was like wow I can't believe I hadn't given given this a second chance in so long 
I think I was doing a lot of like Apache Hadoop kind of stuff, maybe in that time frame. But it sort of boxes things in. You can still do stuff, I think, like min GW style, but um, for the most part, it boxes everything in. And instead, like min G in you for Windows will compile against the uh, Microsoft C runtime library a lot of times. You'll still have dependencies on various like Unix, Linux type of libraries that are just redistributable kind of libraries. But the actual core C library will just be that old school um, MSCRT.dll or whatever it's called. With the SIGWIN, you'll have dependencies on their C library, to my knowledge, which is so it will have to be run in that SIGWIN environment. Or maybe it won't have to be run in that environment, but it will have to have access. All those libraries will have to be accessible to it. This method will probably enable you to build more Unix, uh, but you will also need to download and use the various other build time and runtime support software described in that file. This set of instructions is meant to describe the so-called quote-unquote native port of Perl to Windows to the Windows platform. This includes both 32 and 64-bit Windows operating systems. The resulting Perl requires no additional software to run other than what came with your operating system. That's good to hear. Currently, this port is capable of using one of the following compilers on the Intel x86 architecture. Microsoft Visual C++ 6.0 or later. I love that. That is cool. Um, you are you probably most definitely have a later version. I don't, it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find a system like if you found some old, maybe like an XP service pack one machine in a garage somewhere that had never been updated. It might, you know, you might find a copy that old, but um, I think I have, I, I personally lean towards this SDK 7.1. That's usually, and I think it defaults to like, let's see here, um, CL, what do we do for version? Does it tell us? To, so it's the compiler version 16, but I think it's, um, it's Microsoft Visual C 10, I believe. They have the two different, ver you know, just like I'm running Windows 8.1, but it's really Windows 6.3 under the hood. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is 10. So, if, and I think 10 actually lines up with 2010 too, if I remember correctly. So, that's that's sort of like the golden era, in my opinion. And you can compile all the way back to XP and I think even 2000. They try and claim that you can't, maybe, or maybe that's 2015 that claims that you can't, but you actually can. Um, but yeah, I've been able, I might have even been able to compile binaries back to Windows 95 with this, as long as you stay within any API constraints. And this stuff should run on Windows 10 as well. So this is just, I don't know, I'm personally overall mostly happy with this compiler setup. Otherwise, you can try like maybe the 2019 compiler tools. They're the ones that I've been most impressed with since then, is that tool set. I wouldn't recommend 2017. That's been my worst experience with anything. And then 2015, make sure you're using at least R3. And even then, that one's such a pain in the butt too. So I would recommend, you know, the 7.1 SDK or the 2019 tools or, you know, anything above 6.0, obviously. And then this one will automatically set up for like, I think, 32-bit release build. But I'll get into that in a second. The Intel C++ compiler, GCC by MinGW, 3.45 or later. That's, again, you're probably definitely, if you download it, you're probably going to have, like, version 8 or later. And uh, also the MinGW64, 443, which, that if you get MSYS2 or a lot of those kind of things, they should all also fall under. I would even recommend those above the MinGW org stuff. So... Note the last two of these are actually competing projects, both delivering complete GCC toolchain for MS Windows. And if you get MSYS2, you can actually install the 32 and 64-bit versions, and they're more harmonious instead of competing. They're still, I'm pretty sure, totally separate from each other, but at least it's like under the same umbrella. So delivers, what is this, item L? Okay. So yeah, the regular MinGW is going to be 32-bit. That one's 64-bit and 32-bit Windows platforms, despite the project name. Microsoft Visual C++, which is what I intend on using, 
Compilers are also now being given away free. We've all known that. Well, they even actually, I was starting to think this readme must be really old, and I'm sure it is, but it looks like it's been updated because it actually rec uh, recognizes a 2019. But the funny thing is it's not called Express anymore, to my knowledge. It's, um, they got rid of that. I think it's just Community Edition or whatever now. But back in 2005, it was called Express, of course. So that basically, 2005 must be roughly Visual C6 or Community from 2017 Edition. Stay away from 2017. Okay, and also part of the .NET framework, blah, 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 blah. Get to 7.1 SDK if you want to follow along exactly with me. So the microphone or Microsoft platform SDK, oh, they're talking about building for the 64-bit platforms, um, MinGW64. Yeah, I think this is some more of that way outdated information, like the 64-bit compiler. If you have anything double digits, we'll say for uh, Visual C tools, any version number double digits, you're you should be good for having the 64-bit stuff. I think an 8.0 was when they started. That was they were built in. You, if you have a 64-bit host, then it would install those. So the Windows SDK can be downloaded from there. If you're using 32-bit compiler to build Perl on 64-bit Windows, then you should set the environment. We're just gonna do whatever to the path of least resistance, which should be 64-bit version on 64 Windows. But, you know, definitely read this for yourself if you're not installing on Windows 7 or higher with um, Windows, with the 2010 or higher tools, you know, if you're deviating from what we're mostly got going on here. And the, the higher than 2010, you know, the 2015 through 2019, those command lines themselves should be pretty much the same, but they they will differ a little bit from what's going on here. You'll have to just automatically launch the right shell window for that which I think I have one of those tools still I think I probably still have the 2015 tools on here um, yeah so visual C++ build tools you can see there's all those different versions and then there's this visual studio 2015 I want to say they're pretty close to the same thing but I think there is a slight difference there's like a path not included with one so if you have trouble try opening the other equivalent shell but you can see there's like arm native tools for x64 so that's going to give you 64-bit tools with 64-bit output that should be roughly the same for 2019 um, then this cross compiler thing is going to give you 64-bit tools but it's going to result in 32-bit executables and this one's going to be 32-bit tools with you know and so on you can see that it's like this is the tooling and this is output. This one's going to be same output and tooling. So ideally you probably want, I mean, there are still versions of even Windows 10 that are 32 bits. So if you want a resulting binary that will run on, you know, run on anything, then you're better off going with like something ending in x86 on here and not ARM. You'll know if you need ARM, you're most likely not. Um, and I don't think any of them require this extra MS build stuff. And so, yeah, the same thing over there. But once again, I'm going to use the the uh, 7.1 SDK tools. So you need Make program to build the sources. If you're using Visual C or the Windows SDK, you can use NMake, which I love. I don't see why MS build and all that other stuff. NMake's like old school. That's what's up. You know, do everything from the command line. This, in my opinion, also promotes like the continuous build continuous delivery style systems like I just prefer to go that route anyway you know just keep it simple the uh, the build tools kind of like have a requirement on you sort of need like the whole visual studio installed to really get the full experience with that and then they're they don't really cater to the command line as well especially for configurations and stuff so it's just like I don't see why anybody ever ran away from NMake but, um, of course, it looks like Perl's using it, and the OpenSSL also uses NMake. So, with Visual C or Windows SDK, you may also use uh, DMake or GMake instead of NMake. DMake is open source software, but not included. Uh, build using GCC, need DMake or GMake, which would just probably be called Make, even though they are 
GMake or whatever. And make is not supported for GCC builds. That makes sense. Parallel build building is only supported with DMake and GMake, not MMake. That's fine because parallel building it goes a little faster sometimes, but it sometimes leads to little bugs and glitches appear in the build process and whatever. Uh, when using DMake, recommended to use that. Blah blah blah. They're just filling in every little detail, which is nice, but it's a lot of reading for us. Um, Command shell, the default command shell, some versions, <laughs> wow, they really get down. Just shows what, like, probably decades plural. The MMake that comes with Visual C++ will suffice for building. Visual C requires that certain things be set up in the console before <laughs> we'll successfully run. To make a console be able to run a C compiler, you will need to beforehand run um, the VCV vars bat to compile for that and that one for 64 on typical install of Microsoft C compiler products these batch files will already be in your path environment so you may just type them without absolute path if you need to find the absolute well on a typical build too you'll also have some shortcut that looks like that um, let's see if I have my SDK Windows was it Windows kits not system I don't know. I would think I have like some Windows SDK folder in there or something. But I guess not. I don't know where it's buried at. Windows Software Development Kit. Um, I think this is the newer. This is probably like Windows 10 SDK or something. Pits that folder in there. But yeah, it's just uh, basically that. The Windows SDK command prompt 7.1 and if you we can say I think it's in the bin folder in here that uh, that batch file so there's set environment it's in maybe I forget where it's at they don't have the most intuitive Layout. Maybe well, can we do dir forward slash s star dot bat? Just install, install, install. VC init. Let's do where, and then what was it called? VC bears. VC bears all dot bat. So we'll do that and uh, how do I paste? Shift insert? Come on. All right. V C V A R S A L L dot B A T. Could not find the given pattern. That's funny. It's there somewhere. That's what this is calling. Shortcut Windows bin set environment start in there. Huh. I guess you can just maybe call that set environment from that folder. That's what we're using anyway. So we can do set env and then do a question mark slash question mark and it'll tell you we want to set that to uh, go ahead and hit up to get it back. We'll do release and x64 and I mean you could literally do like XP or whatever I I almost think the last flag is like completely arbitrary I've never seen it do anything I'll set it for win 7 and then it gives this nice horrid horridly dark green less frantic than the yellow but difficult to see in my opinion okay With some newer C products after 2004, the installer will put a shortcut in the start menu to a new console. Yeah, so that's everything that all of us are probably going to be using. Microsoft Visual C Express Community. These free versions contain the same compilers and linkers that ship with the full versions. Also contain everything necessary to build Perl, rather than requiring separate download of the SDK like previous versions did. These packages 
so basically that's what i was saying about if you have like the double digits and beyond you should be cool um and you don't even need that sdk which is way cool the thing is though you probably if you have like 2015 or beyond you probably will need to get the sdk because what's so stupid is that um like standard io stuff is not included in the uh in the regular like if you okay if you just get the build tools i think it is then which are the command line build tools they won't include the standard utilities the standard io.h and all that stuff which is just like the most ass backwards thing ever in my opinion so you have to download like gigabytes of an sdk just to get these little things that are supposed that are part of the standard c c plus plus kind of distribution but anyway that's been my experience with it these packages, wow, okay, enough about these packages. Perl should now build using the Win32 make file. You'll need to edit it to set it to one of the MSVC first. Okay, well, let's start doing these steps because they don't look like easy to remember stuff necessarily. So we need to go in here to this Win32 directory and the make file right here and you want to open that definitely not with word you want a plain text edit or word pad should be okay and then we're going to edit the uh, msvc90 or whatever it is i'm going to expand this just enough so that it doesn't wrap the lines unnecessarily Probably, what am I? You know what, I'll go ahead and actually um, close this for a second. I'm just gonna right click and drag over here into this empty section, let go and hit copy here. And that's gonna make a backup copy of the file. And then I'll go ahead and edit this one. It's gonna build a shared library, Perl 532 DLL. Build configuration to suit your needs. Most of this will want to probably leave at the defaults. Uncommon if you want to build 32-bit Perl. Nice and self-explanatory. That's cool. Um, I like it. I like how it's nice and clean and well documented. Use 64-bit int. which you'll have your resulting Perl. Since Perl is more of like a scripting environment, that's what I expect. Like anything to do with like 32 and 64 bits is probably more under the hood stuff. So they are just saying, you know, if you want to have that, uh, if you want it to internally use 64 bit ints, but like they said up here, if you're building 64 bit, this is if you're building a 32 bit Perl. Oh, so I guess it's not exactly the same under the hood, but. But either way, I imagine that they both should run the same exact scripts. I'm not a Perl expert by any means. If you want to look, uncomment this if you want to disable looking up values from software Perl. So if you're making a portable version, you probably want to get rid of that. Uncomment this if you want to disable looking up values from HKey current user and HKey local machine, which I personally, I despise using the registry INI files were totally enough. They made way more sense, made things way more portable. They were way more human readable. And uh, Microsoft finally went back to admitting that not too long back. But from Windows 95 on, they were like, registry, registry, registry for everything. And then you just end up with this impossible to read, virtually impossible to read database that's mixed in, intermixed with your system. And it just, it made zero sense. So... I'd recommend maybe even doing that. I'm just leaving stuff at the default though. Path of least resistance because who knows, maybe that will create some domino effect. Okay, so here's uncommon exactly one of the following. So I believe, see right here, this is where it all lines up really nice because 2010 is AKA Visual Studio 10. I'm not using, that's funny because my tools say if I do a CL, 
slash question mark or yeah then at the very top there you can see it says compiler version 16 for x64 obviously they're not referring to that they're referring to the fact that the 2010 tools so I'm assuming this is what it should be so it makes it so difficult because it's like SDK 7.1 compiler version 16 but I'm almost positive this is what it lines up with I know it's not the 2015 tools it might be 2008 actually I'm starting to think it was 2008 now oh man really give me a break Microsoft give me a freaking break Release notes. Just type start release notes. That should take them to the browser. And Visual C 2010 with improved performance and speed. So it says it has the 2010 compilers in this one. Okay, I'm going to roll with that. Yeah. All right, go back over to this one and uncomment just this CC type and hit Control S to save it. But we still need to find those varies. Oh, that is the one. So there's the variable that we're enabling the CC type to one of those all right this free version da 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 it doesn't contain everything for the tw 2005 so 2005 or before you'll need to download the Windows SDK and get the core SDK and the MDAC SDK components I doubt anybody will need that um, set platform SDK dir. I don't think we should need to do any of that since we're using the shell. It should have any of the necessary stuff set. But we'll keep in mind that, you know, partway down in this README Win32, there's some sometimes I have had to go in and set these lib path kind of directories manually for some reason they the way that the software the uh, compiler chain stuff configures itself doesn't always pick those up Perl should now build using the win32 make file you will need to edit that file which we did they're repeating themselves now Oh, I guess that's for specific Visual C versions. We must have been going with the more modern stuff. It's looking like we might. I'm going to keep scrolling down here. This is interesting. I've never built Perl on Windows that I can remember. There's a thing for building a comprehensive Perl archive network, offers a wealth of extensions, some which require a C compiler to build. Note that not all of the extensions available from CPAM may work in Windows environment. You should check the info before investing too much effort into porting modules that don't really build. Most extensions, whether they require a C compiler or not, can be built, tested, and installed with the standard mantra. Yeah, there we go. That's sort of like configure make make test install kind of pattern where make is whatever make program of course I don't think Windows would use dollar sign variables I wonder they'll use the percent ones I wonder if we have a uh, no 
doesn't look like it. Let me type percent make percent. No, nope. not a big deal. Option to use make written in Perl. Wow, that's cool. Back to the D make G make. I guess a lot of people who came in here to add to this were just like, screw it. I'm. They're not gonna go down and go through all this junk. But for the sake of completeness, like right here, notes on 64-bit windows, some stuff we might not want to miss. Um, so this is long, long pointer. It's saying like what stuff, that's sort of like an underlying architecture to describe how the operating system, how much 64-bit your operating system is. So LLP means that long, longs, not just plain old longs, but a long, long, and pointers are 64-bit. I think every so-called 64-bit operating system has 64-bit pointers, so they'll all have a P64 in there. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to even call it a 64-bit operating system, really. But, uh, and I'm pretty sure this is the model that Windows always uses. Maybe not, though. You can, Wikipedia has some stuff on that. Data model is different from the LP, which would be which would mean from longs and up are 64-bit. That is the norm on Unix platforms. That makes sense, yeah, like Linux and stuff and Mac OS X. In the former, C int and long are both 32-bit data types, while pointers are 64-bit. In addition, there is a separate 64-bit wide type. Da, 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 in contrast to the LP data types, which is pervasive on Unix platforms. They're just really getting into technicalities, which is cool and interesting, but I don't think it's too big of a deal here. Both models provide for 64 bits of addressability, which is what the 64-bit pointers provide. 64-bit Windows running on Itanium is capable of running 32-bit x86 binaries transparently. Um, I don't. Most of us shouldn't have an Itanium. This means that you could use 32-bit build of Perl on 64-bit systems. Given this, why would one want to build 64-bit build of Perl? Here are some reasons why you would bother. 64-bit native applications will run much more effectively on Itanium hardware. And I think that's sometimes debatable on 64-bit hardware. There's no 2 gigabyte lim on, uh, you know, like a x86 64-bit. But usually if it takes full advantage of the 64-bitness, then it should run more efficiently in theory on a 64-bit platform, of course, but there's there's some exceptions to that. There's no two gigabyte limit on process size, which two gigs is a lot, <laughs> but hey, you might need more. Perl automatically provides large file support when built under 64-bit windows. Embedding Perl inside a 64-bit application, that's key for sure if you plan on doing anything like that. Running Perl scripts, got the hash bang line to indicate that the to the OS, really only Unix is the one that I know of that like properly deals with that. It's a joke. I mean, it's not a joke. And that, and you really only even need it on a Unix, Linux, Mac OS X, if you make your Perl script executable. Um, if you're running it like Perl space, da da da, script name, um, then you don't even need that. That's just in case it's an executable. That's a standard Unixy kind of pattern to say, hey, you can find the proper interpreter for this, and then you have the, the absolute path to an interpreter or absolute path to the EMV, ideally, I think, these days, and then like an interpreter name. A little bit bizarre. File extensions associations. Uh, I probably... Let's see, let's go back up to that one. File extension associations don't work everywhere and there are reportedly bugs with file associations. Yeah, I think the best bet is just to make sure that the Perl executable is in your path and then go from there. And I like to have it usually, even especially with scripts, is to have those open in editors, you know, rather than if I click like even an HTML file, I usually don't want that to open in the browser. I want it to open in an editor. And then I'll just go into my editor. I'll usually have a, I like to use lightweight syntax highlighting, and that's about it. Um, type of editors. Oh, my mouse is freezing up again. And uh, I'll just add a little thing in them to uh, to preview in the browser or whatever from there. Or I'll just do right-click, open with, and then select the browser for that particular time. 
file gets changed on C. A script called run pearl.bat is available that can be copied to any file name along with the bat suffix. For example, if you call it foo.bat, it will run the file foo. Oh. Okay, so it's a batch file that looks at the name it was invoked as and then in turn launches that Perl file. That's pretty clever. I like that idea. So if you want something that's sort of like self-executing, just like a double-clicky thing that you can distribute to people, that's an option. Miscellaneous things, full set of HTML documentation is installed. Perl doc at the command line. I think the C is supposed to mean like C colon backslash kind of thing, and then Perl doc is like the command for browsing uh, information contained in the documentation. I'm pretty sure that's installed with... Uh, it might not even be installed with Windows, but it's. I'm pretty sure that's almost always installed with the uh, Unix variants. GitHub, there's there's the GitHub site for Perl 5 stuff. Norton antivirus. Uh, disable antivirus. Give me a break. Close your ports. Learn how to use your computer. A Git GUI shell. Nah. What, what was it say? I'm interested. A git GUI shell extension for Windows such as Tortoise Git will cause the build in later CMX to run slower. Yeah, all oh, they're talking about building from Git. I don't really use those GUI tools with it. Even uh, Git Bash for Windows or whatever, the standard one even comes with its own little GUI thing in there too. But I've never, I've used it like once. So. That's cool, we're at the end of the file. It looks like we should be good to go. So go back up to the top here. Did it give us the basic rundown for the basic commands with the make style commands or what? Some weird C runtime stuff. Okay, what was here? Okay, we'll go back to this one. Oh, this was just this file. So I'm going to close this out, save it if it needs to be saved. And then uh, go ahead and close that one. Come back over here. Where are we at? We're in the Win32. We need to run this make file. So we can probably just run nmake on that file. I'm going to double check real quick and come back here and go back to the readme. Win32. Is that the one we were just at? Yeah, because this editor remembers where the file was at. So we read that one. Let's go back to the plain readme. And installation. So we're basically going to do that and make thing right there, I think. If you run into trouble. Okay, let's try it out. So I'll go to that source directory, Perl, and then it's like uh, and then what we need to go into the Win32 directory specifically, CD Win32. So I'm in my source folder. I went ahead and made an extra Perl subfolder and then I'm going to Perl 532.0 slash Win32 and I can see there is the standard make file right here, as well as that backup copy, which shouldn't interfere. We'll find out. So I'm going to write, first I'm going to do where and make just for kicks. And we can see it's Visual Studio 10. That would have been one trick. And then this AMD 64, even if you're on Intel, it's probably going to say AMD 64, which is fine because AMD was actually beat Intel to the punch with x86 compatible. 64-bit architecture, thank God. So I'm not a big Intel fan, but I, I am somewhat of an AMD fan, so that made me very happy. So we can do nmake, oops, spell it right, and then say make file, and hit enter. And it didn't work. Make file is up to date. Hmm. Okay, maybe like this and make 
win32 make file. Do not know how to make av.h. This is where the fun begins. Okay, just type and make maybe I think it was and make. There we go. It's always a while between I use some of these tools and this is a good sign right here. If it just starts doing this, that's how it rolls. It's a lot like if you're familiar with custom compiling for Linux, of course it's using, you know, the Microsoft style commands more, but yeah, especially if it starts, you know, you get several screenfuls and it keeps going. That's a good sign. Who knows, it may dump out, I mean, half or more of the time whenever I compile programs, even if I follow every little jot and tittle, you know, stuff will drop out and be like, oh, you don't have Zlib or something installed, or we don't know the path to it. So that's all normal stuff. If that happens, you just go in and carefully find the first error. Sometimes it will dump out a string of errors that are like a few page fools or more. You'll want to usually scroll back up. Um, you may even have to set your your window command buffer. It's linking already. Warnings can usually be ignored. Um, you'll go in here and like either defaults or properties. I think properties should just be the specific window. And then you can change like your, your width, your buffer size right here. That's the key one to get that scroll back buffer. You'll want to have that at some thousands of lines value. Um, maybe not too crazy big, but, you know, maybe 10,000 lines even if you want. And then there's, you can see I, my window, if you like this style of dimensions, you can even effectively get this to go full screen, you know, by changing that stuff up. And of course you can adjust the fonts and quick edit mode, which quick edit mode's nice to just be able to start highlighting right away, but then to get your tools, you have to like right click on the title bar, I think. And colors. But yeah, just set that scroll back buffers. The main thing, set that to a really fat value. And this could take from a few minutes to a few hours to compile. And it's kind of, it's compiling an environment. I imagine it will take my system, which is pretty close to two gigahertz. It is a quad core, but this is only gonna use one of those cores and I'm running a video recorder, desktop recorder, so that's going to slow it down a little bit too. But that, in theory, should be running on its own thread if the thread scheduler for the operating system thing is any good. So right here you can see I'm using three quarters of my CPU. OPS is using a little over a core. Let's list it by CPU. There's mini Pearl. Hmm. It's mini Pearl. That must be included with the Pearl distribution. That's pretty rare to see a binary file, like sometimes a scripty file. That's cool. That's clever if that's what's going on. And we can also do it by memory. Of course, we're getting all my Chromium tabs. Um, doesn't look like anything's using too much memory at a time. Go ahead and put it back. Let's see about disk. Mini Pearl's using some disk. Then of course we can go over and look at the graphs, the overall graphs of what's going on. So my CPU's not even ramped up. It's not even running at the full 1.99 or whatever it usually does. So that's kind of a good sign, I guess. But half of it's being utilized, which I think means that two cores are being pretty much fully utilized. Or maybe, you know, one core plus two half cores or something like that. Okay, I don't like to have to re-encode my video because especially like what it does to my voice it's already annoying enough and 
all the recompression crap and then it just takes me extra hours of work and stuff just to go in and like speed up this section so I'm gonna go ahead and just drop the video pause it and then I'll pick it back up when uh, when it's finished so it's 303 on the clock right now see here pause all right CPU fan just spun down so I checked it out just less than a minute ago probably so it looks like it took less than 15 minutes to build and I did see that mini pearl thing fly by it is under the source tree you can see it right here C source pearl pearl 532 mini pearl so it's right in there where do we go towards M pearl glob exe and there it is, Mini Pearl. Let's look at the properties on that. It's given a 2020 date. Well, anyway, so that's how that was working. And then what I did was I went back into that README file, the uh, right here under the Pearl 532 source folder, top level source folder, and then go down to the README uh, Win32 file and I opened that back up and I searched for install if you just search for installation and you know hit the next button a couple times it'll take you maybe a hair past midway in the file and you'll have installation of Perl on Windows which I seem to have just skipped right past the first time through and that's basically saying what we'll do is an nmake install to install it and or of course you know one of the other makes if you use that for some reason and that will install it to whatever that folder was that we didn't bother setting in the make file so let's go back and double check where that might be come on get back up there so win32 folder subfolder and then we'll go into the make file and I'm going to hit control home and then I'm going to do control F search for INST top. And there we have it's install drive Perl. So it looks like it's the install drives right above it, obviously right there, the C drive. So it's just going to put it in a Perl subfolder. I will real quick, let's see here. And then you can see this. It's everything's up to date. Run and make test. It's recommending to run the test suite right there it's recommending that we do that that sounds good I'll go ahead and run that um, real quick yeah I'll go ahead and start running that right now it might take a minute but I didn't want to shift away from the screen input if I did and right here I'm going to uh, dir c pearl c pearl star doesn't look like I have a pearl folder yet so that's a good thing CD C Pearl. Ooh, I do have Pearl 64. This was from Active State. That's not supposed to be there. So I'll do an RMDIR forward slash dash forward slash Q, which will do a uh, and subdirectories quietly. And then we'll do Pearl 64. And then make sure that out. Yeah, it's gone. Couldn't do any tab completion. So I'll exit out of there. And it looks like what's it doing? Maybe it was just double checking that you might even be able to literally run like and make test and that would just automatically build all the prerequisite libraries too. So it's what it looked like in the documentation might have been a possible option. But either way, what do we have here? I'm going to scroll back using this little scroll bar here. need to make a color command prompt so it's easier to see where that was so here we can see and make test that's where we started running it program maintenance utility up oh, got new output okay so it's building again if this takes more than a second I'll just pause the video again and come back bzip2 
and I may already have like dependency. I mean, it's looking pretty clean. I didn't get a single error or hang up or anything, but I've had this computer for years now and I've used it to do tons of building. So I could have, you know, like I mentioned, like if there was a Zlib dependency or something, I may have Zlib libraries in my path that I installed five years ago or something that I've forgotten about that, you know, you might not have that. So in that case, um, if there's a way to leave a comment below this video or whatever, do that and I'll dig in and see if I can figure it out. Otherwise, just go to get that library just like you did with Perl, like stuff like Zlib and all that. Um, try and build it from source if you can, or even if there's binaries available, you know, you'll just want to make sure and get the bitness. And if you're using the Microsoft build chain, then get the ones built with the Microsoft build chain you know, and probably maybe even like a specific version or within a specific range of versions. And if you're doing the uh, GCC, MinGW, MSYS build chain or whatever, then you'll want to get libraries that are built with that. And so that they'll be compatible. But most in general, it's either just like either get the Unix -y style ones if you use that build chain or get the Windows style ones if you use like the uh, Microsoft Visual C compiler stuff. Which even though you don't see Visual C, Visual C++, Visual Studio going on, what we're using at the command line is those same underlying tools that that, that system calls up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause this again, the screencast. Okay, it's not quite done running the test yet, but I just want to show what the output looks like. You can see it's like run, switch. Dot T, which I assume stands for test. Dot, 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 dot. Okay, so all these OKs I'm assuming are saying that the test is running okay. And some of these tests are being skipped, like it even has a reason, which is cool, saying various portability issues only for dev versions of for now. So those, even though they're skipped, they're um, they're skipped for reasons, which is cool. Right here, it's running any of T. Looks like there's a thousand eleven hundred eighty five tests maybe to run. We have a UTF-8 test, socket test. It's pretty cool. I'm excited. It's nice to go from, you know, so not everything lines up with my expectations when I do stuff like this. I was actually prepared for a battle, and I thought, great, this is going to turn into one of those, like, six-hour ordeals that's chopped up to a three-hour video or something. And so far, it's doing better than a lot of my other videos for time and stuff but uh yeah it's exciting because it's just like with that whole you ask for the banana and you get the gorilla in the jungle too kind of thing and uh i just wanted the banana and i'm getting just the banana it's beautiful but anyway i'm going to pause it again pause the screencast again and i'll unpause it once the tests are done running for the install all right it looks like it went ahead and ran the tests anyway. I took off, so I don't think it took a full hour to run the test. Maybe it did, but I took off at just before four on this time up here, so about 40 something minutes ago. And I started running these tests around 3.20. So they ran for over an, a half hour at least. And then it looks like it was doing something where it was trying to you know, obviously make some call through the firewall. So if you get this and the tests are still running, if you're quick enough, you can allow access or you can go into your firewall settings ahead of time or hit allow access now or cancel, whatever. It's just going to make a test or 10 or whatever fail. I'm going to go ahead and hit allow access. So a few of the tests at least did fail. I saw that flew by on the screen which probably isn't a big deal. I mean, I usually don't even run, I'm gonna scroll way back here. I usually don't even run the um, the tests when I install software like this. If you plan, I mean, if you're having problems or whatever, I just, I don't know. The tests, there's so many variables for failure and stuff that in a situation like this, I imagine that most of them are probably expected and uh, otherwise it, has a lot to do with at least back in the day when I actually you know 10 plus years ago when I used to actually try and run the test because 
when everything started finally getting real big on testing from like, I don't know, sometime before 2010, people, I'd say between 05 and 2010, they started, you know, the whole thing of testing got real big, test-driven development and all that, which is good, but a lot of the tests were more leaning towards developer machines or even to this day, like more of like a continuous integration build setup or something. So the likelihood of test failing is just, I would say more likely than not in a lot of situations. So do you, there's not a lot of ways to know for sure which way it should go. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even run the test, honestly. Like I've built entire Linux systems from scratch and didn't run any of the test because it just brings into, especially on like Linux and stuff, it brings in tons of dependencies and you just, you never know, is that test failing because of some nuance between my machine and theirs and all that junk. But honestly, today they're starting to get a lot of places, like even this Perl one, I was surprised at for how long it ran without having any errors in the test. So one thing you could do is go in and like look at each failed test and think, you know, go in and like kind of give it a once over and dig in a little bit and see like why was that test failing you know and maybe that's one that should just be marked as skipped on the windows platform or um, maybe it's failing for a reason and you know or maybe it should just be a warning instead of an error or something like that but anyway i'm going to scroll down here now let me actually go all the way back up and make sure so that looks like it was a few warnings and stuff on a compiling this so what I see it says CL that's the C compiler I think it stands for like compiler linker or something it's the Microsoft one and no logo da, da, da. these are all just flags passed to that that compiling that one particular module you know so it was obviously compiling a few extra things for the testing then we get down here and there was a bunch of warnings I think those flew by on the screen earlier when I was recording and then down here keep scrolling down still just a bunch of compiler stuff typical output even on fully functional programs and stuff so I don't think there's really anything to worry about and then we get down into here and this looks like it's probably all the tests and we're getting a bunch of okay's and skipped for specific reasons which is good so that's sort of like they're catching the error in that situation so to speak if they're skipping it like that and then you get down here and you can see this one of 128, this substring TL test. I could even, it looks like it's part of the maybe RE regular expression library, I guess. So we could try and look that up and see what happens. And then just paste and search. It's doing a Python. Um, actually, let me grab more of the error there. So it's this is Windows, so it does like this box thing in command prompt. I don't use PowerShell. I think it's junk. But anyway, I'll copy that. I just highlighted it with the left mouse and right click to copy. If it's not showing up, you can either just right click. Oops. Or you can right click up here and go to edit and grab, you know, mark and then come back up right click at it and copy and then the same thing if you want to paste it too so let me go all the way back up there so basically it's ready to install I could run an end make install and it should install it to C Perl if you're sick of this video and you just want to jump ahead and do that and then without touching anything I'd imagine you could zip up the C Perl directory and effectively probably have a kind of portable Perl install um, and if you really want to get crazy with it, you could do like an install script with, uh, you know, one of those installer programs like Nullsoft installer or something could do all that stuff. You could go back and build like a 32 bit version as well. And you could either, you know, zip off or rename that directory to like Perl 64 and then do a, a complete compile with the 32 bit one and then save that as like Perl 32 and then also either save those off to their own zips and or add them to an installer or whatever your little heart desires or um, you could even just run them you know just put them in your path whatever use them for whatever purposes I plan to use it to compile it's sort of the configure program it looks like for open SSL 
So yeah, I just highlight that, right click to copy it, come back over here, go ahead and append that on there. And then let's see if that's enough info. I might insecure environment path. This might be too much for it. Oh, Pearl, mail list archive. So this looks like it's back from 2014. And what do we have here? Just built Pearl on Win32 using attached make file. Peculiar uses imp sys is commented out, Pearl malloc not commented out, and Win64 is not commented out. I'm building on 64-bit Win7 Pro. Build seems to have gone well. I ran nmake, da da da. Got the following results. Test report summary, nmake fatal, Pearl return code. Um, the test CPAN module build, T test. I don't think we're quite to the CPAN stuff yet. I don't know. So anyway, this is, you could come into all this kind of cool stuff and dig through all these and see, I normally build using this and that and stuff. This looks like it's for a little bit older version of Perl. Or using this, getting a little bit more of a custom compile or an older style compile. So you can dig in on that and see if it helps. Um, or you could just, you know, path error while running or um, insecure while running T switch at test PL. Whatever, you could dig open that test file, just really do your homework around this stuff. And then you could go do a bug report or go and maybe they prefer you go into like a forum first, discuss it um, and or open a bug report on it. I kind of look at bug reports these days, like on GitHub and stuff, as just basically kind of like a forum themselves, you know, so I just usually go straight for that. Um, dubious test return 255, whatever. I mean, chances are the active state and the strawberry pearl and all that, they probably ran, they probably did the same kind of a build and more or less got the same kind of test results. So I doubt they stopped and really checked it but who knows maybe they did maybe they added their own custom patches to this stuff to like fix it up a little bit so whatever fail tests I mean if you're a developer and you're running on like the official continuous build system and stuff like that then you really shouldn't be you know with like the de facto operating system or whatever that the projects using if you or following all your P's and Q's on that, then you really shouldn't. Failed tests are bad. But who knows, you know, <laughs> like there's people that get failed tests and just leave them. You know, that's one of the bad things about test-driven development is that ideally there should be no failed tests. And honestly, it looked like there were 10 zillion tests because you can see like this is test one of 72 and there were tests one of a hundreds or one of thousands and stuff on each. It looked like under each one of these T's. So you can just figure like, you know, just imagine if each one of these is 100 tests. There's just so many tests that get run. And the vast majority of them are okay. Here's time.t, failed test, Perl, uh, GMT time, not a number at this thing, whatever. That's, I know time, the way that time's accessed between Windows and the Unix type systems is different. So that could be like an obvious type of thing. But honestly, if you go through and file a bug report on it and, you know, maybe then if you're even willing to take the time to go in and patch up the test and, at, you know, maybe turn it into a warning or a skipped or something a little bit more information wise, uncover the problem a little better. So option implausible on Win32 past make path UID line 848. So it's kind of... You know, that one looks like a good example of it's not completely skipped, but they at least went ahead and said that, you know, spit that out to the command line to say that, say that. So that's like halfway kind of a solution around it, it looks like. But maybe that one should be even smoothed out, polished up a little more to say like just skipped because it's, you know, 
implausible on Win32. And speaking of Win32, um, that just shows how old this is. You know, it's obviously before 64-bit Windows was even a thing. And they had called it Win32, which back in the day, Win32 was like, you know, the new thing. Windows was originally 16-bit, and it wasn't in tor until towards, uh, you know, closer to 10 years later that Win32 really started to take off. There was Windows... You know, because Windows was like, what, 85 for Windows 1.0? And then Windows 95 was, which was when all the consumers were introduced to the 32-bit, was 1995. And then there was Windows NT a few years before that, but that was only on back-end business stuff. But that was 32-bit, and that was the introduction of Win32. And so that was against what I think was retroactively named Win16, so what they started calling everything was like you just say, hey, this is Win32 instead of just Windows. And then people would know, okay, I need to either have, you know, the Windows NT back end, which Windows 2000, XP, Vista 7, so on, were all based on that Windows NT back end. And, uh, or the Windows 9X back end, which was basically merging the Windows 16 with the, uh, with the Win32 stuff. So... It's still, I think everything was thunked down to 16 bits in the Windows 9X series, which included Windows ME Millennium Edition. And, but it could handle 32 bits, so it was like a glorified Win32 subsystem, basically. And then everybody at Windows 2000, they finally started to push it back towards the home market more and say, okay, they had brought in more of the stuff that made it to where it was like dual compatible with this like windows 16 ish kind of world and then of course windows xp polished that over even more and then from there it was just definitely more of like a singular ship instead of having the the home and professional things even though they did have windows xp home and professional but i mean like you know you're basically had the same front end on either operating system and the same back end, too, for the most part. All right. So anyway, yeah, feel free to skip the test if you want. If you feel like, hey, no big deal. I just want Perl. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't in a few places, it doesn't. Who knows? And I think you'll probably get an error if you try and do just like these tests did. Most likely, I'd imagine that you probably get an error, too. So you can see there's just a ton of them. And each one of these is a batch of tests, apparently. So we'll get all the way down here, and yeah, a bunch of stuff to do with like Turkish. So I don't even have that locale installed. Obviously, that probably requires that locale installed to even handle those tests. There's stuff like that, you know. All right. And we come down here, failed test, 71 through 72, to do past. So this is the test summary here. So if you did do a bug report, I suppose, I mean, they probably want you to attach the full file, but if you just like pasted something in as like the summary, you probably want to just paste that in there and go from there. So... What we'll do now, we're still in that Win32 directory. I'm going to go ahead and do an nmake install. At first, I'll do a dirc perl so you can see that it's not found. And then I'll do an nmake install. It's obviously x copying everything over. Shouldn't take more than a minute or so. Oh no, is running the test part of this step too? I don't think it is, but it may be. It may try and rerun all those tests again, who knows? That wouldn't be very cool. I 
looks like it's at least checking that all the object files are built. And also at least making sure my video is horrendously long as usual. Can't blame it on Pearl. It's my fault. I could pause it. But I have a feeling as soon as I pause it, it's going to be done. Alright, fine. I'm going to pause it. It's taking too long. Alright. 838 files copied. That part seems normal. But then if I go way back up here... It looked like it was running some of this stuff, like it almost looks like compilation stuff, but then you come in here, it's mini Pearl. And there was like, um, where is it? There was stuff to do with like CH mod and stuff, which, and CP for copy, which are Linux, Unix, Mac OS style commands. Now I can't find them of course, but I was like, why is it even trying to run those? Like right here, command, ECHmod 755. So it's like almost attempting to change the permissions. And who knows, maybe this looks like a Perl module thing. So it's like, and it's being called by mini Perl. So maybe either behind the scenes, it probably just goes off into the void and doesn't really do anything. Or else it in, like quietly interprets that to the Windows equivalent if there is one. Um, same thing for, I was thinking these were CP lines, but maybe they were, I was just seeing that as it flew by or something. But anyway, it was doing a bunch of stuff like that. And then you get down here, and what's this say? Pearl, install Pearl. So I guess it's just copying all those files or getting them ready to copy at that point. And a bunch of lib files. And the documentation, which you can see is in right here, they're at C source Perl, you know, the source tree. And then over here, C Perl HTML. Huh, that's funny. It said it was going to do it under Perl than the version, but whatever. C Perl HTML lib x utils, da 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 da. Maybe that needs an update too. That documentation, that install documentation is probably based on a really old version. So it looks like we probably have everything there. And that's what I was, I don't know if I ever finished explaining the Win32 thing, like Win64, a lot of, especially these old holdovers like that, it also encompasses Win64. And that's a lot of the reason why Microsoft and others went back to just calling it like the Windows API, because of reasons like this where Win32 could be ambiguous and confusing kind of thing, because it's like, wait a minute, isn't this Windows 64, you know, and it seems like it is, so just call it Windows and forget about dealing with all the little whatevers. We all know it's at least 32-bit. So C Perl, and there's the bin directory, the HTML, the lib, and the site. Um, let's see if we can just be outside of it and do a where Perl and if it will find it. No, because it's not added to the path. So we just do uh, path path equals um, percent path percent semicolon c pearl oops pearl bin I imagine and then we can do where pearl and there it is pearl version and there we go pearl version da 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 ms132 x64 multi-thread 87 through 2020, Larry Wall. Cool. So that's that, and I plan to do sort of a follow-up video that is the same thing, but with OpenSSL for Windows using the latest current version as of September 2020, which is 1.1.1G. Thanks a lot if you held out, held in this far. Take it easy.